Hi, and welcome to the Conscious Marketer Podcast. I'm Richard, and also joined by my co-host, Kylie. Hi, Kylie. Hello. And today we have a special guest, Mark Mawini. He is a lifelong entrepreneur who helps coaches get more clients. And the interesting thing about that is he does it without paid advertising. Um, he does this through his coaching programs. He has uh, a popular Natural Born Coaches podcast. He has a Facebook group called The Coaching Jungle. I love that title. And a print newsletter, The Secret Coach Club. He's been a speaker at events like Social Media Marketing World, Entrepreneur City Live, and the TP3X Conference. He makes frequent media appearances and contributes to online publications like entrepreneur.com. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the podcast here. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. And we normally start by just asking kind of how you started uh, helping coaches and, you know, specifically, you know, there's a lot of different types of people who help coaches, but uh, you, your brand is kind of natural born coaches and maybe a little bit about how that, that brand came about as well. Yeah. So um, I've been in the game since 2014. It was March, 2014. Yeah. So we're looking at about uh, nine years. Time flies. Uh, it's it's an interesting path to it. I'm sure you hear stories all the time. I, I didn't grow up saying, "Hey, I want to be a coach." Coaching really wasn't a thing when I was a kid. But uh, in a nutshell, I went uh, build up a good size real estate business here in Canada, and then everything collapsed. You know, so I built up to a number of uh, real estate companies, sister companies, uh, about a hundred employees, agents and employees, and then boom, it, it all collapsed. And I had a couple of years going through the wilderness trying to find my way, and I was helped back to my feet by several coaches. And that's how I found out about coaching and how I eventually got back into business as a coach in 2014. Um, oh, the brand part too. Uh, I, it's kind of an interesting story. Um, the the Cliff's Notes version is when I was trying to come up with a name for you know the business, podcast, and all that stuff. Um, I, I did what a lot of people did. I, I came up with some names on legal pads, jotting them down, but they're either taken or maybe I wasn't really feeling it. And I basically um, went through the uh, Billboard Top 100 songs list every year from 2014 for down to back 25 years and i was inserting uh my keywords coach coaches coaching into a lot of song titles because i this is how desperate i was to come up with a name i'm like nothing's working and i couldn't find anything at all through the billboard list and at one time true story I actually owned the domain new coaches on the block.com which was was awful. I'm glad I never did anything with that. Uh, so then I did the same practice with movies, of course, starting in 2014, going all the way back. Wasn't having any luck till I got to 1994 with um, Oliver Stone's Natural Born Killers. Great movie. Woody Harrelson and um, was it Juliette Lewis, Robert Downey Jr. Anyways, I inserted uh, the coaches in there, Natural Born Coaches, and it just, you know, it hit me. And I was like, wow, that's great. I like that. And then I had the most nerve wracking 30 seconds any entrepreneur has when they rush over to GoDaddy and check to see if the domain's available. Luckily it was. So that's how I came up with the name of it. So what does it mean exactly to be a natural born coach? Uh, well, I think that most people um, now don't get me wrong. There are people that get into the business for the wrong reasons and probably shouldn't be coaches, but I find that a lot of uh, people in our world uh, are just natural, naturally gifted for it. I hear a story a lot of times, like in high school, for example, they were the ones that all their friends went to, to, to talk uh, things through, get advice and to bounce ideas off. And they're just, um, they they gravitate towards them. So I think that a lot of coaches, or at least the ones that are successful, uh, find that there's something inside them that they just naturally they're good at it. I know I'm using the word natural a lot there, which may not answer the question great. But um, yeah, just say, same as when it comes to entrepreneurs, you know, there's natural born entrepreneurs, there's natural born athletes or whatever. It's just something innate um, that's in there. And, and it definitely makes success much easier. I'm kind of curious because you've produced over 800 episodes on your Natural Born um, Coaches podcast. That's a lot of episodes. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of curious um, how the podcast plays a role in your business and supporting your own coaching and your and your own business growth because it seems like that's been a really a primary vehicle for you to get your your word out into the world. I'm kind of curious how that how that sits in your business model. 
Yeah, I mean, it's huge. It's one of the big, I say, pillars or legs of the table for my business. Uh, so you know what it's like where you to have a podcast and stuff. I, I'm a huge fan of podcasting because it's a great way to meet really interesting people. You know, I've made really good friends and, and they become joint venture partners, sometimes clients, you know, people I would have never met virtually uh, before having a podcast. I would say I credit the podcast with being the first thing that really I got traction with, with my business and it opened up a lot of doors with it. And I wouldn't have done 800 and some episodes of if I didn't like podcasting or think that it, that it was so powerful. Um, now the asterisks I'll put on it. A lot of times people think, Oh, I'll start a podcast and it's going to be like a magic money tree in their backyard and it's going to be spitting out money. And you know what it's like, there's, it's not a matter of just starting a podcast. You also have to have a business on the other side of it. You know, there's two um, sides to the coin there. And I think that's where a lot of podcasters, miss the point they just say oh I'll start a podcast or whatever but then they don't have the other parts worked out with a compelling offer or who are they try speaking to who do they want to work with and how can you monetize it in there so it's uh if you're going to start a podcast don't overthink it you know jump in and, and you're going to figure some things out but you should have a plan on the back end okay what's my business who do I want to work with and how's this podcast going to uh, connect those people with me so you talk a lot about growing a following and getting clients without a lot of paid traffic. I also saw that you have a Facebook group with 24,000 people, which is rather impressive considering how many groups there are out there. How did you grow that group? Like what's the secret there? I had a bit of a head start with the group because uh, before I started the coaching jungle, I had a Facebook group for past guests of my podcast and had a really uh, unique name for it. I called it the natural born coaches past guest group. So it was pretty boring name. Uh, but what was happening was um, I had a couple hundred uh, guests in there at the time because my show was daily when, for the first year. So I got up to 350-ish episodes really quickly. Uh, and I kept getting people on Facebook, coaches requesting to join that group, not seeing the past guest part. And so I would have to send a standard message. Hey, Kylie, thanks for um, requesting to join my group. However, it's only for past guests of my show. Best of luck or whatever. And after enough times that was happening, I thought, hmm, maybe I should have a Facebook group open to all coaches, not just past guests of my podcast or aspiring coaches, people interested in coaching. And that's when I launched a Facebook group was uh, the fall of 2015. Uh, with it. So I had the first uh, between people who were in the previous group that I invited over, and then just where my name was out there with the podcast and other things, I had my first, you know, 500 or so people in there pretty quickly. But since then, it's grown steadily uh, with, with some really good people. Um, now, I'm not saying you have to start with 500, you don't have to have 24,000 people to have a profitable Facebook group. I know people with much less uh, than that. But uh, and how did it stand out? It really, it's just consistency. You know, I showed up there every day. I talked about it on podcasts and social media to my email list. And I just um, kept it front and center. And I find a lot of people, Facebook groups will say, well, no one's joining my group. And I'll ask them, I'm like, well, do you talk about it? I'm like, well, I put a post up Wednesday night at 11 o'clock and I got one person from that. I'm like, no, you need to do more than that. Uh, I always say you have to be like the parents of a newborn baby where you can't shut up about the baby, how cute it is and, you know, uh, all the stuff that it's doing. That's what you have to be like with your Facebook group. You can't just uh, talk about it once or twice and expect people to come flowing in. I think that's probably a really good natural lead in to um, kind of this idea of how to grow your your lists and your client base without paid ads. Can you maybe share some of your ideas and tips around that? Yeah. So the reason I got into the organic marketing side was really was necessity. So back in my real estate days, I spent a lot of money on marketing. Um, now this was a stone age. We're talking about the first decade of the new century in you know, early two thousands, but I was spending tons of money on um, hard uh, uh, postcards. I was mailing out all across the city, yellow pages ads, remember yellow pages, <laughs> um, radio ads and all this stuff. So I was spending a fortune and, and I got a bunch of business rushing in. Uh, when I started my coaching business, I was a few years coming out of the business closure. So I didn't have access to a bunch of money to throw into ads, uh, which at the time I was frustrated because I thought, oh, this sucks. If only I could do what I did with real estate. Uh, but looking back, I think it was probably a good thing because it forced me to roll up my sleeves and actually uh, put the, the work into it organically. And I find that a lot of people online, they jump in and 
Uh, maybe they have money from, um, you know, a severance package or, or money in savings. And, they're, and they think, okay, well, I'll spend 30, 40,000 on ads and these funnel ninjas to help me out and stuff like that. Uh, but and they're trying to sh- a shortcut it. I get it, but then you're not getting that practice of of honing your message and getting really good with it. I didn't have any choice because I had to uh, shoestring it and do it that way, and it ended up working out well for me that way. And and that's why I teach my clients. You know, I, the methods I teach and, and different things uh, doesn't require ads. You could do ads. There's nothing wrong with it, that, and supercharge some stuff. But it's all organic strategies. So if somebody's just starting out and they know nothing about any of this, where do you usually start your clients out? Like what's the first step to getting clients? Um, well, I say buckle up because it's not a get rich quick thing. You know, um, you're going to throw some spaghetti at the wall, uh, hopefully not too much spaghetti to see what sticks. Um, really, I, I tell people not to overcomplicate it though. And, and if they can answer three questions, and I mean, this is for my world coaches, but I know you guys have other uh, people listening to your show and stuff, uh, but if you, it, this is applicable to them as well. If you can answer the three questions, who do you help? Uh, how do you help them? And finally, where do you connect with them? So who, how, where? You're light years ahead of most online entrepreneurs. And I know it sounds really simplistic, but it, most people can't answer that or they're at least fuzzy on it. And that's where they struggle. So that's where I start really with, uh, with my clients. I want them to be able to answer those three questions and then we'll build out from there. Yeah, that's, I, it's interesting how many people don't answer the basic questions when they get online and then they wonder why things are kind of going sideways. <laughs> well, it's it's really fun times now. You guys have probably noticed the last few years, people, I see it all the time, people who've switched from, um, I don't know, Bitcoin expert to a clubhouse expert when clubhouse was a big thing. And then they were big on, um, I don't know, a couple things in between crypto and other stuff. Now it's chat GPT, they're AI experts. I noticed within a week of that being the hot topic this year, there's a whole bunch of chat experts or AI experts out there. Um, I have something I call a barbecue pitch. And ideally, I want all my clients to be able to answer it. And basically what a barbecue pitch is, is if I uh, bumped into you two at a backyard barbecue and, you know, explain, uh, exchange pleasantries about the weather or whatever, but then I say, so what do you do, Richard? Or what do you do, Kylie? Uh, Barbecue pitch is um, your answer to that question. And what I find a lot of people in the online space either um, look like deer caught in headlights, they don't know exactly how to answer that, or they go go into a rambling big long speech it's kind of like mr smith goes to washington you know big long filibuster and uh you want to be able to answer that really quickly so i mean for mine for years i've said i help uh, coaches get more clients without paid ads um one of my online friends is uh, i help people he his is i help people make their first ten thousand dollars online so if he said i help people make money online that's too broad too general um, he ends up bringing it down. So it's not just I help people make money online. I help people make their first $10,000 online. So it's very clear that he's targeting newbies, not people who've already made a bunch of money online. And I thought that that's an interesting example for it. But a barbecue pitch is basically an elevator pitch. I, I like saying barbecue pitch. And uh, I find very few coaches and online entrepreneurs have that nailed down. Not to derail us too much, but you mentioned AI. Are you using the chat GPT or the AI in your marketing at all? Yeah, I wrote out the whole script for today. I've been reading off it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I've played around with it. Uh, full disclosure, I'm not a, an expert and it hasn't been anything uh, super in depth. I know some people are really getting into diving into it. I probably should. Um I'm a little hesitant because uh, it's probably from almost a decade of creating all my own content and creating a lot of it. I kind of, I'm kind of like um, Charlton ha- uh, Haston with his, uh, you'll get the guns out of my cold dead hands. I don't want to have like AI creating a bunch of content for me. And I know people say it just helps with it or whatever. Um, I'm a little nervous that a lot of people online are going to think, oh, this is easy. I don't have to write my own emails or create my own courses. I'll just get the, the AI to do it. Uh, so I need to get past that little mental block to really let go and dive into it. But yeah, to answer your question, I, I haven't used it much. I've just played around with it a bit. How about I've you? Been, oh, I've been playing around with it a little bit, asking it to write ads. I had it write yep. a fake ad about a coffee company the other day. <laughs> oh, what, yeah. I found, what I found is like the structure is kind of quite nice. They know how to, they know how to, or they, yep. whoever it is back there <laughs> knows how to write 
good structure for an ad, but the content that I'm getting is not that great. And people keep telling me, oh, it's the prompts you're giving it. And I'm like, I am giving it some pretty good prompts. Yeah. It's spitting out some interesting material to work with, but I find that I have to go back in and add the emotion and the soul and the heart. It's not really, they're kind of flat. What I'm getting back is flat. Actually, I have a friend or I should say an acquaintance who is selling an AI course to like heart centered entrepreneurs. And I almost took it. I want, I got excited. I was like, oh my God, it's a whole year of like learning Mm. how to use AI. And this guy's really cool. He's the first person teaching a course that, I would actually want to study with. And then, and then at the end of his sales page, he put like three paragraphs that he wrote with AI and I, I did not resonate with them at all. And so I didn't buy the course. I was oh. like, Man, you shouldn't have even put that on there. I would have, <laughs> you, but now I don't want to because it's a basically yeah. on par with what I'm already doing on my own, you know? So it'll be interesting to see where this all evolves and like you, I have done my own content for such a long time that I'm a little bit like, okay, people are saying that this AI is beating the humans out in terms of conversions, but I I can't quite stomach the idea of speaking to my clients like a robot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way. Uh, one of my past guests of my podcast reached out, oh, probably about a month ago. And she said, can I get your opinion on this, Mark? Uh, what would you think if I, uh, if you received a pitch for someone to be a guest in your podcast that was like this? And she um, told me that she had AI write it for her because she's trying to get out on more shows. And I looked and I said, I'll, I'll be honest. I said, this would get trashed, um, you know, be in my um, garbage pail of my e- e- email. I wouldn't accept you on there. And I, not that there's anything wrong with it, but it was just very, uh, like you said, with the sales page, with the last few paragraphs, it just, there was something off about it and it just didn't grab me at all. And she's very um, heart centered, you know, she's a great person, great personality and stuff. And I said, you'd be better off d- doing it your own way, reaching out there and stuff, just like she got on my show uh, with it instead of trying to get the AI to handle it because it wasn't good. So I think it's good if you're stuck um, writer's block or, or to get the wheels going and, and stuff like that. But I think it's good for people who like us that still want to use our personality because if everyone's getting lazy and they're just relying on the AI, I think that people who are using personality will stick out like sore thumbs. Yeah, I think, well, when everybody goes right, sometimes it's good to go left. When the mm-hmm. AI kind of trend started yeah. to come in, I was like, well, let's start talking about soul intelligence or heart intelligence instead of artificial yeah. intelligence. And so I kind of I kind of went the other way and I was like, let's just lean into that. And then uh, it occurred to me that as there is more AI generated content, it increases the power of something that's actually original and also increases the power of story, you know, cause AI is not going to generate stories that have come from your own life. So the power of story increases exponentially as, as a factor in your own marketing. So that, so that's exciting, you know, cause the, it just means authentic authenticity and naturalness wins, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I'm always a little nervous. Um, who's the uh, pulling the strings behind because of course there's programmers and there's natural human biases. Um, you know, for example, I interviewed uh, Owen video is someone who he does a lot in the YouTube space, but he's really getting into AI. And as a test, he put in there and he said, um, I forget what it was, something like, can you tell me, um, write a glowing poem about Donald Trump or something? I said, no, I basically, I can't do that and, or whatever. And then say, write a glowing poem about Joe Biden. And it's this flowery, gorgeous, like this guy's better than Lincoln and George Washington <laughs> put together, right? Um, so that kind of reminds me, okay, yeah, there's people behind the curtain there doing that and, <laughs> um, you know, not to get political or whatever, but they, everybody has their biases, but yeah, I don't know. It's um, it's interesting how much people have jumped on the bandwagon. And I always remember with Clubhouse, I don't know, are you two on Clubhouse? I, I hope I don't offend you or a bunch I'm of people. On there. On I have the app, but I, I, yeah. I don't use it. I haven't used it really ever. Yeah, never- so back. I never took the, I never took the hook on Clubhouse. I was you like, didn't you drink know, the Kool Aid. Well, do you remember uh, January and February of twenty twenty one? I was getting a lot of pressure from people. It was almost like you know, a cult. You have to be on Clubhouse or whatever. And so I finally gave in. I accepted the when they're given the invitations from one of uh, my coaching friends. And I tried to check it out once. I just, I didn't take to it. I'm like, man, this seems like a tremendous waste of time to be sitting in here. And 
um maybe it was a room i was in it just seemed like a bunch of uh douchepreneurs you know <laughs> like in, a go figure in the online space uh so i said yeah it's not for me and i asked him i, I said so how's it working for you and he goes oh geez it's great i got a client last month from it or whatever and i said well, how much time do you spend on here and he goes well you know i'm about eight hours a day and you know i'm five days a week sometimes i go on for the weekends or whatever um, so true story. I was, um, driving at the time out for a drive with, with my ex fiance at the time. There's a whole other story. Her name was Kylie, but I'm not going to hold that against you, Kylie. Um, <laughs> I, uh, but I said, to her, uh, we were talking about clubhouse and I said, um, I said, I I've only been on here like a couple times and it's always the, the, like I said, the douchiest braggy types or whatever. I said, I guarantee you when I click on here, that's what we're going to hear. And no word of a lie, I clicked on it and the person, the line that the person was saying just as we went in and, and oh yeah, and that's how I made $137,000 last week, blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, there's Clubhouse in a nutshell. So I know not everyone's like that, but I found the time that people would spend, uh, the quality uh, to, to sit on there all day, to hope for a nugget or two or to run these rooms. And I don't know, I just, I got spoiled, I think with podcasts, audiobooks, everything I listen at uh, 1.5 to 2x speed. And I just don't like sitting around for uh, that much time. I, I think it's a big waste of time. So the, the way that it's gone now, you know, all three of us, I guess, didn't get into it or drink the Kool-Aid. And it looks like the platform is dead or dying. You know, I know that some people making money on it, but it really didn't achieve what people were saying it was going to. And that's why it's important to stick to your pillars, you know, those few things working good for you and not get distracted by the bright shiny objects i'm actually quite jealous that you can listen to audio at one and a half to two times the speed if i could do that i'd, I'd hit my reading goals but uh it, it took some practice so the, the client who told me about it at first i thought he was crazy because when i tried it the, the author sounded like a chipmunk and i'm like yeah this is stupid i'm not going to do it but uh, my client uh, swore by it and he said stick with it for a, a you know a couple times you'll get used to it uh, so i don't always go at two x speed if it's a fast podcast host or it's a fast um, narrator i'll slow it down a little but i try listening at one x speed now and i'm like falling asleep I'm like oh man <laughs> <laughs> just my brain's used to it now that's funny a lot of what i hear you talking about is that there's universal principles to marketing that makes it work and it doesn't necessarily matter what the form is. Is that, is that correct? Because I teach that all the time. I'm like, if your message is good, if your content is good, if what you're saying makes sense to the right people, you're going to be successful. It doesn't matter if it's a Facebook group or a clubhouse, big clubhouse group or whatever it might be. Yeah. Uh, for me, there's two big criteria. You know, if you're doing something uh, you should like what you're doing, obviously, because if you hate it, you're not going to be very good at it or you're not going to be consistent. And then it has to be something that works, obviously. And the example I always use is um, if my favorite thing in the world to do is uh, jump out of bed in the morning, open my window and yell out at people walking around the neighborhood, hey, hire me, hire me. You know, even if that was my favorite thing in the world, I got butterflies doing it or whatever. That's probably not a good business strategy, right? So it has to be something that works. But there's so many choices. Now you've got 177 different things that you could do. I really like to focus on three. And my big three, I mean, yours could be different. Maybe uh, you do two of the three or whatever, but uh, and then uh, work in something else. My big three are podcasting. So that's my show, but then also going out on shows like we're doing now. Um, it's community building. So for me, it's a Facebook group, but there's other ways to build a community. And then there, it's daily emails, you know, so if I'm doing those three things, I know I'm going to be okay. And I'll do um, a little bit with other things like I'm on LinkedIn, I pop in there once a day or whatever. But, you know, 90% of my efforts are going into those big three things. I know that you also have a hard copy newsletter and I think that that's kind of interesting because uh, so, so few people actually. Yeah. The environmentalists love me. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> and so, so few people I've subscribed to, I've had, I've been on a few hard copy email newsletters and there's always that kind of thrill when the FedEx or the UPS folder comes in the mail and especially if it's somebody you respect. Can you maybe share a little bit about why you have a hard print newsletter? Because it's a little bit unique in today's world. Yeah, I mean, full disclosure, I'm making some changes. So <laughs> by the time this uh, goes out and, and it is live, then it, the change may be made. 
but um, I've been doing the the um, newsletter uh, since um, 2017, and it just hit the six year anniversary. And uh, what I decided to do, you know, uh, change again, full disclosure, is I'm changing it into more of a um, there's going to be digital newsletter and a bunch of other things in a membership platform, so it'll feel more like a club. Um, because what I'd heard over the years, I had subscribers say, "Mark, I love it. I read it, you know, right away and and mark it up and all that," but it doesn't feel like a club because I don't connect with a network with other subscribers, right? They're just getting that newsletter in there. And I thought, Hmm, there's something to that probably. Uh, then they're also waiting, of course, a week or whatever till the, for the printer to ship it out and all that. So I'm going to be changing it. So the newsletter will stay the same. It'll be PDF form uh, and it'll be in there. But once they join, they can access all the vault, like the back issues or 73 months worth or 74 months by now. And then there's other things like live calls and things I'm working in. So that probably ruined your question because I, I normally gush about hard copy newsletters. I think they're great. It's just for me, I was getting a little bit bored or stale because I'd done it six years and you know almost a hundred months and I wanted to implement a few other things just to make it feel like more of a club uh, with it. Do you feel like you have better retention or better ascension because of doing that strategy? Um, do you mean having like the newsletter at kind of the base 97 yeah. a month or yeah um, just it's different because it's different than what other people are doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting with hard copy newsletters because I've had people think that I'm the only one doing it, but there's obviously a lot more people. I mean, uh, Ben Settles, email players um, is one of the first ones I ever subscribed to. Uh, Doberman Dan, um, the copywriter, he has one. Dan Kennedy, of course, for years uh, had his and stuff. So you kind of have to look under rocks sometimes, but there are quite a few hard copy newsletters. Uh, for me, yeah, I, I think it helps having something that's at that lower range. Although that being said, I don't really want to play in like the $17 a month type world. For me, that's just not uh, of interest. And I see a lot of people uh, that want to do that. Uh, one of my past clients uh, a while back, this was a few years ago, um, he said, hey, can I bounce an idea off you? Uh, he said, I'm thinking of getting onto Patreon because he had like a music background. So he's familiar with Patreon that way. And he's a coach now. And he said, I had this great idea because, you know, um, for he had a podcast as well. He goes for like uh, $5, I'll give them a shout on the podcast. And like $2, I'll give them a sticker in the mail. And $7, I'll do this. And $3, I'll do that. And I'm like, oh my God. I said like that, even if you could sell all those, that sounds like a lot of work and uh, you're cobbling together or a lot of pennies to try to make it work. Um, I don't really want to play that game. So with the newsletter, you know, it's been 97 a month, 997 a year, but with the change that's going in, we're going to a quarterly or yearly, and then there's three tiers. And basically it's going to be 297 a quarter to get started, which also um, eliminates my other pet peeve. Anyone who runs any sort of membership subscription, I hate churn. You know, you do really good. You put out a good pr uh, product and then you get somebody uh, come in for a month and then they leave, you know, or two months. It's just the nature of the beast that's going to happen. But by going with quarterly, I get away from that. I don't want to deal with those kind of flaky people that jump in and out yeah i love that i love that idea of going quarterly too it's a it's a kind of a powerful idea um instead of the monthly we we run i don't know maybe six membership sites for clients oh, wow. ourselves so it's so we we face that you know the back end I wouldn't call it a nightmare but it's just kind of part of doing business with a membership site where people come yeah and, you know I I've had people who have uh, received their first package and I would send out their first newsletter, um, some bonus stuff, a hard copy book of one of my favorite books I recommend everyone read. And I'd get gushing emails back. Oh my God, Mark, I'm so excited for this. Thank you. I love this or whatever. And then like a week later, I get the PayPal notification. So and so's canceled their subscription. I'm like, oh, okay, geez. Or I've had the other thing people, uh, oh my God, Mark, I love the newsletter. It's amazing. I have to cancel it because I haven't opened it in the last six months. I've been so busy. Busy. I'm thinking like, come on, you can read this in 15 minutes and put it to work. If you're not, if it's collecting dust on the shelf or whatever, I don't really want you in there anyways. Uh, but that's been the, the, 
the challenge for me and I think everyone online is um, you don't want to be a, a dink to people rude or whatever, but you also want to chase away the free pull and the cheap pull, you know, and there are a lot of them online that don't have any intention to spend any money. They just want to get all this free stuff and it, it'll eat you alive if, if you're too open with that. So you have to kind of uh, put up a moat around your castle, I guess, protect your time, defend yourself from brain pickers and stuff like that. So yeah, I, that's interesting, but the membership, the side of it, because that, that's why I was thinking I like the quarterly, then they at least have time to implement it. It's not uh, rushed, you know, and, and get results and stay in there longer. Well, it's been really a pleasure to talk with you today. And you're just doing such great work helping coaches out there and your program sound amazing. Um, can you maybe share how people can get in touch with you and find out more about your work and services? Yeah, I mean, the best place is naturalborncoaches.com. Not naturalbornkillers.com, naturalborncoaches.com. <laughs> That's super funny. And he has that, uh, he has a Facebook group called The Coaching Jungle as well. Go on there and join that. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining us here today and being on our podcast. We really appreciate you sharing your wisdom with our audience. Yeah, thanks for the invite. And uh, we'll see you. We'll see you around, Mark. And for everybody listening, thanks for being here today. And you can get the show notes and all the links to Mark's um, work at consciousmarketer.com forward slash podcast. And we don't run ads, but if you want to go on to iTunes or Spotify and give us a review, we'd be very grateful. Thanks for listening and see you on the next episode. Bye for now.